Welcome everyone to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. This is your weekly show on YouTube where we talk about the latest goings on in the music teaching industry. And sometimes, like today, we have a special guest. Today we are visiting with David von Kampen to learn about some fabulous short pieces, which I know is something we're often looking for at various levels. So welcome to the show, David. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So good to have you here and looking forward to hearing some fabulous music. But before we get there, I'd love to know a bit more about you. I don't know much about you and neither do a lot of the viewers. So tell us a bit about your music background and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, I am a composer uh, and a pianist from Nebraska in uh, Midwest United States, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. I am a uh, lecturer at the University of Nebraska Lincoln School of Music. Uh, I teach music theory and ear training and history of rock and roll, and I direct the jazz singers. So I'm, I'm busy as, a, as an educator. Uh, and uh, I think I said composer and pianist, more of a composer than a pianist, but uh, enough of a pianist to play these pieces. Fabulous. So tell us about these books. This is actually your second volume. What inspired yeah, so you to write the first volume? Where did this come from? So the first volume uh, was called 12 uh, Very Short Pieces for Solo Piano. It looks like this. Um, and I composed those in the summer of 2020 when everyone was uh, hiding away safely in, in their houses. Um, and uh, because of the, the COVID situation, obviously, uh, people were not gathering and making music. And uh, the, the best way I found to sort of scratch the compositional itch during that time was to write for solo piano. Uh, music that would be within my own technical capability to play uh, and then recorded that music and released it. And it was kind of a, a fun summer project during a time when uh, I obviously couldn't be writing music for singers or, or doing that kind of thing. Um, and then this last winter, just a few months ago, um, I started thinking that it would be fun to do another set. And uh, it seemed like a good idea to do 12 more since we did 12 the first time around. Um, and they're just very, well, you'll hear when I play them, but they're very short, uh, sort of a range of difficulty levels. Uh, some, some I would say are like intermediate to advanced and others are, are very much uh, playable by, by younger, less experienced players. Um, but I just wanted to, to do something fun and write a, a lot of short character pieces, um, uh, music that would sort of like stay in the attention span of, you know, what, what I wanna listen to. You know, everyone's not always in the mood to put on a 11 minute piano work, but uh, if you've got 12 of them and they're all just a, a minute or two long and, and then you can kind of digest them a little more easily. That's that's how I was thinking about it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Just to clarify on the level, it's not like a level collection that's going from easiest to hardest. It's much more of a mixture than that. Is that right? Yes, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, chaotic <laughs> in terms of the difficulty <laughs> level. Uh, there's there's no order um, and, I, and I gave no thought to the difficulty level either. All, all I knew was that I wanted to be uh, music that I would enjoy playing and that I would be able to play. And I would call myself a, a passable pianist, uh, but not a world-class pianist. Um, and some of them are kind of at the brink of what I can handle. Uh, and, and some of them are very easy for me. So, so there was really no method to the, the range of difficulty level. Uh, it just kind of came out in a sporadic way. Yeah, no, that's so fun. And I love that what's tied them together really is that they're all short. Obviously, they're all from your uh, musical perspective but they're also all short and that is something actually that I think gets harder and harder to find the greater the le as the levels increase which I find mm. to be a shame because it means that more advanced students intermediate advanced students they end up not encountering enough music in my opinion I know I didn't as a student you know you get really yeah. jammed into learning some big sonata and that's all yeah. you do for a really long time. And while that's great, you also need to learn a variety of different things. So I love that they're short. That is, that is so interesting to hear from a, an actual piano teacher's perspective because I don't teach piano. Um, but I remember taking piano lessons and, and you're right, as, as you progress in your ability, you are sort of expected to take on like larger and larger uh, works, right? And And it, it almost becomes like something you would have to justify to play short music or easy music. But really, like our, our best pianists and our advanced and intermediate pianists 
should play music that's approachable for younger players because then we're uh, doing music that's hopefully great and, and setting an example and, and demonstrating music that younger players could actually play. Like if I go hear a piano recital by a professional pianist, it, it's going to be brilliant, but I'm also going to hear two hours of music that I'm not good enough to play. Um, so just like giving giving uh, people the opportunity to hear music that they could actually play uh, and, and hopefully doing it at a high level is, is really exciting to me. That's definitely something that has drawn me to these projects. Fabulous. Okay, well, without further ado, I think we hear, need to hear some of this music. So yeah. I'm going to leave it up to you, which uh, piece right. we start with. Sure. This is called uh, Ren and Willa Say Goodbye. And it sounds like this. was absolutely fantastic so catchy so oh, interesting yeah. so much Gosh. happening in a short piece of music right love that that's yes <laughs> that's absolutely the idea I, I i love part of what i love about these short pieces is that you you don't have time to like slowly develop something you've got to like get in and be interesting right away and that's that's thrilling to me so i'm glad yeah. that came through absolutely and something that didn't occur to me till now but is absolutely relevant is that our teenagers are listening to shorter and shorter music which is skewed by the spotify algorithm we won't get into that but <laughs> yeah. it has yeah. been pushing people towards shorter and shorter music because of the payouts and the way the way that they work so teenagers aren't used to waiting for an idea to develop itself you know yes. even more yeah. so than those who listen to pop 30, 40 years ago, they expected right. to get to the yes. point. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we need to, we need to uh, be aware of the, of the short attention spans. And I feel that too. I mean, that, that from my perspective, that's also part of what I like about these is I, I think my attention span is shorter than it would have been if I'd been born 40 years ago. But either way, like uh, hopefully if nothing else, this can be like a gateway into, you know, music by serious music by living composers. And, and if someone were to hear these pieces and then start exploring other things I've written or other things other composers have written that are maybe not so short than, you know, all the better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great opportunity for, for piano teachers to, if a student does latch on to a particular piece that is on the shorter side, you know, you can take one of the ideas and explore where it might have developed from because everything comes from somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't take much to, to make someone like a composer. You know, if, if I find a if I find a 30 second piece that I love, I'm gonna look at everything else that composer's done and I'll probably end up listening to their 30 minute symphony too. Yeah, absolutely. So I know teachers, a lot of teachers are actually uh, composers or have students who compose as well. So they might be curious about the background. Where did that piece come from? Like, did one of the ideas come to you first? How did you go about writing it? That one definitely just started with the the, the germ of the, the musical idea that kind of kicked it off was just that opening. The idea of kind of like a quick swing feel with sort of a, a repetitive groove going. Um, that, that, was, that was the basis of it. I would say for most of these pieces, the very first thing you hear was the very first thing that I sort of improvise to get it rolling and then, uh, and then develop it from there, which again, in a 40 second piece, doesn't take too long. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, beautiful. Let's hear another one. What do you have for us next? Yeah, this is called Swim. <laughs> Thank you. 
Fabulous. That was dreamy. I can already think of a couple of my students who would love to play that. Gorgeous piece of music. Oh, thank you so much. So you called it Swim. Did that uh, title just come to you? Does it make you think of swimming? I mean, I, I see where it comes from, but where did yeah, you get it from? That's, that's probably one of the least meaningful titles of the set. I think the music sort of reflects the idea of motion and, and smoothness and um, the, the, just the words seem to sort of capture the character of the music. But beyond that, uh, there's really no, no bigger meaning behind it. Um, many, many of these titles are references to, to people I know or things I care about or think about. And, and in this case, it was really just a, a word that seemed to fit. Yeah, it fits beautifully. Well, thank so, you. um, thinking of where this music comes from, are there any particular composers that you think have influenced the, the music that you create? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I, I have, uh, partially a, a jazz background and, and I listen to a lot of uh, Bill Evans and Brad Meldow, sort of pianist composers from the jazz idiom who are masterful improvisers, but also I, I think of them as composers first. Uh, and I'm often more interested in sort of like the the setting up of the, of the piece than the eight minute uh, improv exploration that follows. Um, so I, I think about those guys a lot. Uh, composers like uh, Maria Schneider and Bob Brookmeyer, um, and then away from the jazz side. Um, I, I like a lot of the same classical composers uh, that everyone likes. Uh, the the uh, melodic ease of somebody like Mozart, um, lots of choral music, uh, Victoria and Herbert Howells, uh, a lot of choir music in the English tradition. Um, Grieg, uh, his, a lot of his short piano pieces are kind of a uh, spiritual model for, for something like this, I think. Um, so that, that's a, a pretty good start, I think. Absolutely. No, that gives us a great overview. Okay, what's the next piece you'd like to share with us? The next one is called Dad, I Have a Question. <laughs> what this a great is for, title. This is, this is for my uh, eight-year-old daughter, Greta, who uh, never stops asking questions. <sighs> Wonderful. I love that title and the story, obviously, that we can all resonate with as teachers or as parents. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I have to ask, because I presume she's heard the piece. What does she think of it? I, I think she liked it. Um, <laughs> she's uh, she's very interested in, in whenever I put music out, like going to find it on the Internet. And she, she, she thinks it's a very big deal uh, to have music out in the world in places where she finds all the other music she listens to. Um, she wasn't quite as impressed with this individual one as I thought she would be, but I think she liked it. Oh, okay. What's her favorite? Does she out, have a favorite? It wasn't, it wasn't an outsized reaction compared to everything else. Um, she might like the other one for her more. Uh, the, the, there's another one later in the set called Dad, I Have Another Question. I think she, liked it. I think she likes that one better. Should I do that next? <laughs> yeah, let, we have to hear it now. Dad, I have another question. 
question. <laughs> it's fantastic. And in a way, I can see why she preferred it. Just knowing, you said she's eight, right? Yes. Knowing most eight-year-olds, that one's even more impressively fast. So, but well, it it, 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 it intensifies. The questions intensify as the day goes <laughs> on. So, <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> intensity is certainly appealing to that demographic. I can give you another intense one if you want to hear it. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for a couple more. So, two more. All right. Yeah. This, if, you, if there's two, I'll do this one. This is this is the the most gimmicky piece in the set. The, it's three measures long. You can see the entire score there. It's called Try Your Hardest. And it's a okay. pattern that repeats. And the, the instructions say, repeat measures one through two continuously. Start slow-ish and gradually get faster. When you're going as fast as you can, continue for a while, then finish with measure three. Fabulous. That's fantastic. I can see that being a great piece. Every so often, sometimes teachers need a piece to convince a student to improve their technique and demonstrating yes. that yourself and how fast you can make it versus how fast they can make it by the end. That's right. Would make, be a great, a uh, great persuader, oh, for man. sure. That's, I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Carrie said, as a mom of a daughter, you've done a fantastic job of capturing what they sound like through music. So she's, <laughs> she Thank agrees you so with you. That was the goal. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we have time for one more. So I'm assuming, is this going to be your Great. most favorite one? Uh, actually, it might be. I, I didn't plan it out that way, but I think if I had to pick one out of this set, this, this might be my favorite. This is uh, called Soaring Oranges. That might be my favorite too. It's probably between oh, that one and the first one for me. But the, oh, the, thank you so much. Yeah, the the title you said, "Soaring Oranges." Is that right? Yeah. Does that have a story me behind it? Where there are oranges soaring? I can picture them. It should. It should yeah, I, I should make up a story so it sounds better. But no, I just love the idea of like slow motion oranges just floating across the sky. Uh, yeah, that one could have been called any number of things, but I, I thought that was uh, a, a nice uh, a nice picture to paint with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's too good for this, but it also could be sold to like a juice company. Is it the soaring oranges through the kitchen gradually? You know, <laughs> not too good for it at all. I think I think all our juice commercials should have uh, better music. So I would. Well, I would yeah, that's be happy, true. I would be happy to. Uh, uh, send it on over if you know any uh, juice companies. Yeah. 
<laughs> if anyone knows any juice companies, I agree. It's just too good for the genre as it stands now. That's all I was Thank saying. Thank you. Put, put it in the chat and I'll get in touch with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fabulous. Uh, David, you have to tell us where we can get the music. I have the links in the description, but if people want to go yep. find it and type it in directly. Both of these. Both of these collections are available from the sheet music web sp- uh, website, musicspoke.com, uh, uh, where I uh, have a lot of my choral music for sale, but also these uh, piano uh, pieces. Uh, and my website is uh, davidvonkampen.com. Uh, and there are other links to uh, these pieces and others. And uh, this whole set and the first set are also uh, anywhere you stream music. I, I recorded both sets and released them as albums. So you can find them on Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. Yeah, which I love because it's always great for students to get to listen to the pieces as well and especially to hear the composer playing them. I think that's so wonderful. Fabulous. Well, I hope everybody goes and checks them out. Um, It's been a great selection today and I know there are lots more because there's really 24 of them in the full two volumes. So I hope everyone goes Mm -hmm. and checks them out and thank you so much for coming on the show today, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was delightful. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. All right, everyone. Did you enjoy that? I loved all of those pieces and the variety we got to hear today. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, Carrie, I think I've answered your question now, just seeing it, but I was answering it anyway. But yeah, the link is in the description. So if anyone is not sure about the, the music listing site because I hadn't heard of it before music spoke so it's like you know music speaks in the past tense music spoke um so yes it's gorgeous definitely worth looking at I'd say especially if you have say advancing students uh, there are some easier pieces as you said but if you have like intermediate advanced students who need some different flavors, things to play in between working towards an exam or bigger projects or big recital pieces or things like that. They, this can provide little taste. They still have lots of great challenges and lots of interesting different things going on, but they are on the shorter side, so they're more accomplishable. That's not a word, but that's what I mean. During, you know, a, a shorter period of time and then you can just go on to the next big project if that's what they want to do. Fabulous. Okay, does anyone have any general questions for me today? Type them into the chat and I will get to them. I have a few notices for you in the meantime. So first of all, if you are a member, um, or even if you're not a member, so if you're a member, you're already going to have access to this. Next Monday, before this show and after the show, I'm do- doing two sessions of a masterclass. The masterclass is called Plain Sailing Policy Changes and Rate Raises. So this is going to be a really active session. It's going to actually be on Zoom rather than the normal format we do. So it's going to be a chance for you to come on Zoom with me. I'll present a little bit at a time, but then you're actually going to be doing the work also within the masterclass. So if you block out that 90 minutes, you will be ready to make the change you want to make in your studio, right? So that is next Monday, earlier than this show and later than this show, two sessions, because it has this really important live component that you actually participate in it. Now I will provide replays, but I think it's going to be a lot more beneficial to attend live. So that is really for any policy change you want to make, any change you want to make in your studio, or if you're considering raising your rates and you're not quite sure how to go about making that change, because I know how scary it is. This is something I've been considering doing for a while and I was inspired again to definitely go ahead with it by a recent podcast, no, not a podcast, it was on Instagram from Christina Whitlock, who I mentioned often on the show, but... um. She was on Instagram stories and she was just sharing about, you know, she was about to make a rate raise and reduce her student numbers and things and how she advises other teachers on this. And it's still scary when you're doing it for yourself. So (laughs) I feel the same way. It's still scary for me to do it myself. I've done it enough times that I have the confidence to just do it anyway and do it the right way and do it strategically and carefully rolling it out to my studio. 
So that's what I'm going to help you to do. So even if it's your first time ever raising your rates, you can absolutely benefit from this. But even if you do it every year and you're just not sure about your system for making these kinds of changes, I hope it'll be helpful to you. So if you're excited about that, let me know in the chat. It is for members, it's included. There's a option to buy just a ticket to that masterclass if you're not a member. So I've put that in the description as well. That's just if you're sure you don't want the membership right now, but you would like this masterclass, you can just pay a one-time price and come to either or both of those sessions next week. So yeah, I'm hoping you'll come along live. It's going to be more beneficial for everyone if you attend, because then we're workshopping different people and the changes they want to make in their studio. And the more different perspectives we have, the more beneficial it's going to be for everyone and for the replay viewers. Okay, a couple of questions coming in. Karen, how is Mini Musicians 2 course the different than Mini Musicians 1? Or is it a continuation? It is a continuation. You should never do Mini Musicians 2 without doing Mini Musicians 1 first. So the idea behind it is that Mini Musicians 1, for those who aren't familiar with Mini Musicians at all, it's a preschool group program that's included in Vibrant Music Teaching membership. And it, everything is included. It's a full curriculum. So Mini Musicians 1 is 40 weeks of plans. If you want to do less, of course, that's fine. It's designed for groups of three to six, maybe eight students, but smallish groups of preschoolers or three to five-year-olds is really what we mean. And three to six-year-olds at a push. <laughs> so um, the idea behind it is that it's a no practice curriculum. So students do not have to practice at home. There's no expectation of that. If you want to have them practice, of course, it's up to you. All our materials are completely flexible to your situation. But the idea of it is that people the students do not have to practice. There's no reliance on them having made a certain amount of progress each week. We're just exploring each week and gradually learning concepts through that. So if they go through that first year, they'll have an idea about piano keys, high and low, and mostly they'll have a really good introduction to rhythm and oral concepts, because I think that's what's most beneficial to develop at that age, but they do have a basic introduction to piano geography and things through improv and games. When a student graduates from that first year, for some of them, they will be more than ready for one-on-one um, -on -one lessons or your standard lesson format, even if that's group. But for others, they still need more time to absorb in that context. And it could be because they just need to go at a slower pace. They're not, in your view, ready for private lessons. Or the way I prefer to say that is they're not ready for the type of private lessons that you offer, like your style of teaching. You know they're not ready for it. For example, you require kids to already know the alphabet or something like that, and this kid just doesn't. But they could still benefit from staying in music. So Mini Musicians uh, 2 does develop a lot of ideas. It is a continuation. It is more difficult as it does progress. But it's still that slower pace, that no practice requirement. The other reason, of course, that students might prefer to go into that versus graduating to a different type of piano is if their parent still doesn't want to buy an instrument for at home or can't, or still doesn't want to help with at-home practice because they're still a young kid, right? So you need the parent to be involved in practice for it to happen. So I hope that gives you maybe more than you asked for on that, Karen, but I wanted to give everyone an overview just to give them a sense of what that's all about. How can you remind students to play with their wrists in alignment with their arms and not let the wrists droop down? Great question, Rachel. Okay, so... There is a sense, a, a degree to which you might have to remind them, but I'm just going to put it out there, first of all, even if I sound like a broken record, that you should check the bench first. We all see it all the time, I feel like, on Facebook and things, and so we might be sick of hearing it or seeing it advised, but you see a lot of photos of a student and they're saying, I just don't know how to get this kid to raise their wrists. 
And the bench is too low, too high, too far out, too close. It's just the bench. And it sounds so basic, but it's so true a lot of the time. So first, check the bench, make sure it's appropriate. Make sure it's also appropriate at home because they're carrying through their habits from at home into the studio. I kid you not, we recently had a student in my studio who sometimes was on a desk chair, the kind that swivels. So you, you just, and he had had a, it, like it was all about moving house and things. It wasn't something we'd let carry on since the beginning, but it did happen. So it can happen to anyone is my message there. And you should definitely check at home. What are they sitting on? How is it organized? Do they have somewhere to put their feet? Okay. Assuming all of that is fully covered, Rachel, then do we need to remind them to raise it? How do we remind them to raise their wrists? We still need to understand why are they dropping their wrists before we can answer that question. So they might be dropping their wrists because of the bench, as I already said. Second reason would be because they're overcompensating for something. And often it's overcompensating for um, not being able to use arm weight correctly before they do legato. I feel like I said that the wrong way around, but what I mean is when students do legato too early, they're trying to control their fingers and they haven't learned properly to control, to, to play non-legato, dropping into the keys, etc., using their arm, moving from their shoulder, you know, all that freedom we need. And so when they haven't got that foundation and they try to play legato with just their fingers, they kind of overcompensate for it sometimes. And yes, this makes it even harder, but they're just like trying to control their fingers. So that would be the second most common reason that I see this happening. If neither of those is the case and they really do just need a reminder, then... First of all, make sure they understand why the wrist needs to be where it needs to be. And you do have all the technique in place. If it really is just a reminder though, come up with a fun signal. So brainstorm it with your student. Make sure at first that they're on board. They also think they need to remember to raise their wrists, but they're just having trouble remembering. If that's the situation you're in, you can brainstorm together for a fun signal. You can download an app that has like animal sounds, weird alarms, songs, whatever. And every time they wrist drop, you press the button, right? So that can be really fun. But work with your student so that they have chosen it because they need to commit to themselves that they want to remember this, they just need help, right? There's a big difference between that and nagging, being nagged. So animal sounds on the phone or you know, you jump up in the air or you go where, where, where with your hands or <laughs> you do some other signal. It literally can be anything, but get your student involved, give them a few examples and they can either pick one or come up with their own and they can change it at any time. What they can't do is opt out of the reminder system if they do understand the benefit of it. Hope that makes sense, Rachel. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we are going to... Nope, I just saw one come in. It just hasn't gone come through onto my screen. There we go. So, Roseanne, any tips on helping students to play on the tips of fingers, rounded fingers? This is a challenge I have with some of my students. Okay. Whoa, this is a big one. <laughs> so, Roseanne, first of all, you may be asking for your students' fingers to be more rounded than they actually should be. Maybe. I don't know you. I don't know. Okay, so this is just putting this out to the masses. Let's just first talk about how rounded should our hands be. Because I know that in some schools of thought, and maybe some people, the type of lessons you grew up with. This wasn't me, by the way. I did. I wasn't ever told this, but some people were told to curl their fingers as in literally almost like a claw, right? If that's what you're expecting, you need to re-educate yourself a little bit, learn more about anatomy, um, get involved with different discussions on technique and learn about different schools of thought. I am not a technique expert, but I do try to learn from those who are. 
and those who fully understand the workings of the arm and how this all makes sense and how we can play naturally. And the answer is not super curled, as some people call them, fingers. But the answer is maybe a gentle curve in the finger. Now, it does depend on the hands. What we probably don't want are the collapsing knuckles or the completely flat pancake hands, etc. But the solution to that, as with most things, is further back. So, why are they not curving their fingers? Even if you do expect a more relaxed approach, why are they not getting to that? Why are they playing with flat hands or with the collapsing fingertips? Let me deal with the collapsing fingertips first. Do be cognizant of whether they actually just have hypermobile joints, as I do. So I, my fingertips, every joint almost in my body is hypermobile, meaning double jointed would be the other way to say that, right? So everything kind of bends the wrong direction. And so at some points in my reasonably good technique, my fingers do bend backwards because that's just what they do. And sometimes that is the most efficient way for me to play something. Now, not most of the time, but sometimes. So first of all, we need to check, do they have hypermobile joints? If they do, I would recommend a very patient approach because your their fingertips will get a little bit stronger over time, but it, it takes a lot longer <laughs> from my experience versus someone who does not and just needs to learn the fingertip strength. You can do things like finger pull-ups to help with that, but that's a whole other area to get into. I'm kind of a not specialist. I'm not saying you need to be a specialist in it, but it is a very specific topic. If they do not have hypermobility and you're still dealing with collapsing fingertips, the answer, the question is why? So are they pushing too hard into the keys? Do they not have support from their arm? Is their wrist too low? Why are their joints collapsing? If you're dealing with the flat fingers, then they are not using their arm to play. You can't. Try it yourself, right? Try and play the keys with almost flat. See, my my fingers won't even go flat, but (laughs) you can get the general idea with almost flat fingers. It's entirely the action is going to come from your fingers. It's coming from your knuckle joint. It's not coming anywhere further back because it can't. So... If they have a slight curve in their fingers, it can be supported in the arm. So the answer to that is dialing things back, working on dropping into the keys, playing non-legata, working on arm motion, and working on reducing tension wherever that tension is cropping up for that particular student that is causing them to play in this other way. Not an easy answer, and it's not about reminding them. It's about understanding the root cause, taking it back, doing exercises to work on the furthest back issue. I hope that gives you some idea, Roseanne. As I said, that's a big question, (laughs) but I hope that helps a bit. Okay, thank you all so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure as always. Just one final note for regulars of the show. We, you know, we do a book club. We will be getting back into the regular flow of that. On our schedule, we're already up to reading chapter three this week, but you could definitely catch up with us. So at the moment, reading The Talent Code, which is by Daniel Coyle. And if you remember, you can see my post in the forum with the full schedule, but it's chapter three this week. So if you want to catch up with us, we'll be discussing that next week. And make sure to put your the masterclass next Monday into your calendar now. If you're not a member, you can find the link to register if you want to in the description because I hope you'll join me. It's going to be a great session and we all need to make some kind of change most years. So it's relevant to pretty much all of us. So I hope to see you there. And in the meantime, I hope you have a fabulous week. Bye everyone. Mm-hmm.